Not easy at all, and congratulations to it. It, it is a testament team. to the frugal engineering that ISRO has uh, come Indeed. to be known for, and you're absolutely right, $75 million, uh, and actually taking the lander to the surface of the moon, a feat never achieved before. Indeed. So, Mr. Kamath, if, if we were to then talk about what this means as a moment for India, and at this point in time, I know that you continue to be extremely bullish about the strength of the Indian economy, the role and relevance of the Indian economy in the global order, uh, and those images now playing out uh, on our screens right behind us as well, so we can enjoy both moments at the same time. Uh, you know, you've often spoken about the fact that you're confident that India will be able to double its GDP over the next nine to ten years. Uh, just in light of what we've seen happen in the past year itself, what are you most bullish on? Yeah, I think uh, several uh, factors which makes uh, one bullish. I look at uh, two data points which uh, are really uh, you know, beyond uh, my conceptualization, I would say. One was uh, the consumption of data what has happened in the last uh, five years. Uh, five years back, I could not have uh, looked at uh, the Indian data scenario and said that we would be the largest consumers of data in the world and be at the lowest price point, it's one. Second, even four years back, I would not have uh, dared to say that we will have the largest number of daily digital transactions in our country, of any country. And you know, there are you know, large countries, our size there, who were ahead of us on both metrics. And uh, we could uh, actually take a step beyond, as it were. That, to me, uh, adds to several other things we're, that are building up. That is, uh, I start at uh, you know, the basics, uh, the balance sheets. Yeah. The balance sheets of corporate India, balance sheets of uh, the bank, uh, the financial sector of India. Last three, four years, the sort of cleanup that has happened. And the ability of corporate India to fund itself. Mm. Uh, not necessarily come to the banks. And you know, when I started my career, four and a half is to one was the total leverage. Long-term debt, working capital debt to equity or net worth was 4.5 is to one. And that then corrected particularly in the 2000s. Uh, post Lehman, it came to maybe 2.5, 2.6 is to one. And now virtually no debt. So you have a situation which is uh, in a way uh, appropriate or, or has created a foundation mm. for the leapfrogging. So movement in technology, uh, clean balance sheets, ability to invest, ability to, ability to grow. And then you look at the other side, uh, who will consume? The consumer, if, uh, you know, my belief is if you're growing at the numbers that are required to double in uh, the nine years that you mentioned, then the consumer uh, becomes you know, aspirational and the consumer is ready. Again, if you want to look at, as this happened earlier, mm. The period 2000 to 2005, 2008 was a similar period. The consequence of the opening up and steps taken uh, in the late 90s. Uh, and let's put it this way, the white collar revolution that happened, led by the technology companies, uh, created a demand uh, pull as it were. And corporate India, which was then restructured, yeah. was able to meet the demand. Again, corporate India, as I said, uh, clean. And uh, today, the aspirational rush is created by all sectors. It is not just one sector. And I think uh, even as we speak, there are more sectors being added day by day. Uh, who would have believed that uh, just in the last six months uh, on the services export front, we have a positive. And uh, that number, as I believe, uh, is set to increase. And again, creates uh, opportunities, creates aspirations and so on. So there's a virtuous cycle that is uh, in motion. Mm. You know, speaking of this virtuous cycle, let me address the first point that you spoke of, and that is what we've seen as far as data consumption is concerned. You're absolutely right. We've seen data consumption go through the roof on the back of the fact that we've got the lowest prices for data anywhere in the world. But specifically from a financial sector perspective, uh, while it opens up opportunities, it also means significant challenges, especially for the incumbents. We just had Mr. Kota here, and he said uh, that is the one thing that he's most paranoid about and he believes that that is the one thing that the sector needs to be most paranoid about as well. You cannot continue to believe that you enjoy the regulatory moat because technology is going to be the big disruptor. How do you see that playing out? How worried would you be for incumbents at this point in time? I would be terribly worried. Um, see, we, if you look back again 20 years, uh, there have been a, maybe three inflection points in technology as far as Everyone, but particularly banks, are concerned. 
in India, it was the late 90s when uh, you know, we could not afford a mainframe, so we migrated to smaller boxes, maybe a Sun box and an IBM box. Uh, and then um, we you know, brought in technology into everything that we did. Thereafter came uh, the cloud. And thereafter, you know, you had uh, what I would call cloud native applications rather than uh, something was retrofitted to the cloud. Uh, today, with the open source, a uh, whole new uh, um, equation has been opened up. And to verify this or to validate this, all you need to look at is uh, the thousand or so fintech startups, uh, you know, that are out there. Uh, and uh, the work that they have done in, uh, with open source, it is tremendous. And if any bank really understands what work these kids have done out there, uh, they, they will not go to sleep, I can tell you this. Because I have tried to understand, sit with them and uh, see what they have done. No banker should be able to sleep. So it is uh, the sort of work uh, they have done at the sort of cost point that are there. So uh, I jokingly tell uh, people today, uh, a banker should ask two questions. Uh, or somebody else will resolve these questions and proceed. Fit hai kya? Is it fit for purpose? Fit for purpose. And, uh, most of these uh, things that have been done, yes, yes, mm. it is. Then free mein hai kya? <laughs> so if it is fit and if it is free, uh, then uh, you are not able to compete unless you adopt the same mindset. Mm. So that's why I say that banks will have to relive uh, what they are doing and mm. uh, relook at what they are doing. Uh, the good news is that uh, there are several solution providers who are now you know, almost ready with the uh, solutions for banks. Uh, which uh, you know more or less meet this criteria. So uh, and retrofitting is not as difficult as uh, was thought. So somebody would have the courage uh, to take the first step. So we'll see who will take that first step. You, you know, speaking of the courage to have to take the next step, and you said fit hai and free hai. Perhaps on the fit, banks will be able to find the solutions, whether in-house or inorganically, by co-opting some of the fintechs onto their uh, own platforms. But can banks really be able to do it for free, uh, as we've seen in the case of VC-funded fintechs? And what will that then mean as far as, uh, you know, the margins for banks are concerned? Many CEOs in this room would want, would want no, to know actually, your point of view. Uh, I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure there are fintechs out here. They will say that actually if you look at their cost, they're not that high. The technology cost is not very high, particularly with open source. And even from the time that fintech started disrupting the last three, four years, things have evolved now. You know, there are vendors who are able to provide you a complete banking platform as an SAS model. So pay per customer at the end of the year a sort of model where you don't have anything else that you had all this time. And I won't say all that, what all that is the hardware, the people, the software, all those things uh, basically can be swept aside as it were and you could put something new. So it's a dramatic tomorrow. And all I'll say is that no bank, uh, no financial sector player, why only a bank, can afford to not be in this uh, space today. That is, embrace the new. Mm. Uh, the digital startups, the fintechs have already done this. Their problem is a slightly different problem. So we'll, when you talk of technology, I, one thing I would like to talk about it because they have excelled in technology, and that is where, that is what I think uh, the uh, the incumbent uh, players ought to look at. That is the sort of disruption that has been wrought, and try to see how could I do that, as long as the technology is fit, and uh, it is um, free. Free meaning virtually free, not really. Uh, you don't pay anything. You will have to pay a uh, appropriate charge for this. Okay. Uh, you know, that's as far as technology is concerned. But since you talked about the aspirational India and you talked about meeting the needs of this aspirational India with the hope of being able to double the economy, what about the appetite of the banking sector? You know, what would you like to see change there? What kind of evolution will we now have to see? Where are we in that next leg of evolution to be able to meet the financing needs of the kind that we're speaking of? See, there are two or three uh, uh, opportunities here and two or three challenges, uh, Shireen. The first is, uh, you know, we need long-term funding, uh, particularly for infrastructure. Uh, the banks will have to think deep on this because uh, uh, you cannot really uh, assume that term transformation will always work. And uh, the banks typically are with the, what is it, one year tenor, one and a half year tenor, depending on the bank, uh, is their uh, maturity profile of deposits. So you can't lend, uh, let's say, five, seven and a half, ten year money, even though you reset the interest rate. Somewhere you will end up uh, running an interest rate uh, risk. So mo banks will moderate uh, their lending to uh, uh, long infrastructure projects. The good news is you have got other savings modes that are coming up. Mm. 
so whether it's through pension, insurance, at all, which are, you know, other, their needs are for longer term uh, uh, you know, assets. So an infrastructure company could actually issue a longer dated uh, products, and uh, you know, uh, that would be uh, something that would be picked up by insurance and pension funds. So I think a virtual cycle can be built as we go along. Then when you look at uh, the banks, the banks have an important role. Banks would clearly fund what we call, in our project financing days, the, the shorter term needs of uh, banks, yeah. not the short term working capital needs, but the initial two, three year uh, need. Yes, you need to have skills in terms of uh, analyzing and assessing implementation risk, but this is something which matches the tenor of funds they have, probably could be a higher priced uh, instrument, so they make uh, money allowing for risk that could be there. And later on, sell down could happen, and this could uh, go to people who have longer appetites. A few years back, uh, you know, we used to talk of this, that is, originate and sell down. Could not happen because there was no counterparty on the longer end. Mm. Now there is a counterparty, a bunch of uh, insurance and other players uh, who need uh, longer assets. So I think it's a right time to get this big push on infrastructure. The uh, government has been uh, spending for a well-known reason. Yeah. But I, I would think that everything is coming together again. This is where, again, my optimism builds up. What is it? Uh, power projects, again, I know most of their uh, issues have been resolved. I saw, I think, on your channel today yeah. saying that discom dues have uh, dropped. Yeah. And uh, as such, you know, power companies are doing well, and they should do well, because I think the lesson is learned. On green energy, I think there have been hardly any defaults. So uh, the discoms have been paying and picking it up. The exchange that has been set mm. up is working well. Uh, in terms of other basic infrastructure projects, uh, we, are, we did not have any stuck projects except in uh, roads. Roads also, uh, NHI stepped in very well mm. and provided the momentum which otherwise could have curtailed growth and uh, economic progress. So both uh, happened uh, to the, I think the firm steps taken mm. by NHI in terms of this vast rollout of uh, highway capacity. And now these, you know, there is again uh, understanding that you have to pay for the road. Mm. So the fast tag is working very well. And so and the private sector is coming back into this. Again, a lot of new ways of financing this entire sector once you're done, you know, in which are uh, clearly one yeah. sector. And our regulator uh, is clearly taking steps to make sure that that becomes something that is well governed, uh, well regulated, well governed. And uh, you know, is so on the infrastructure side where there used to be a question, how will this uh, work? Because projects are not viable, uh, projects fail, and where is the funding? I think mm. the answer is clear. Now, banks, as you said, uh, are going to be uh, rich with money, they have clean balance sheets, they have to lend. And to me, lending at the shorter term certainly is a viable uh, way for uh, pr project financing. But a large part of uh, funding, like uh, of their offtake, like anywhere else in the world, is going to be retail. Mm. And over the last, what is it, almost 20 years, banks have become, uh, I would say, uh, now experts at uh, lending to uh, the retail uh, customer. And the support mechanism, the support mechanism starts with the, the, rate, the, the scoring agencies. And now, not, not, not only the basic score that you had, but multiple, uh, I would say, sources of uh, information, which can go into your credit underwriting model. And of course, uh, we can always say that that model can be overlaid with uh, uh, AI and uh, machine learning and other things. Indeed so. I think it makes uh, your retail borrower a much more firmer proposition than what he or she was, uh, leave us at 20 years back, even uh, three to five years back, because mm. the data pool has increased and your able to, ability to crunch it has increased with AI and uh, yeah. you know, other secondary tertiary and uh, other sources of uh, information going into that pool. So I would think credit costs will come uh, under, you know, very much under what uh, it was in the past, mm. both for corporate India and uh, retail India. And that's what uh, banks will uh, lend and banks will thrive. And, infrastructure, the longer end will be met through the capital, capital market process. You know, given, given the opportunity that you speak of, as well as, in your words, this next wave that we are in the midst of, which has really been driven by the advent and the uh, adoption of technology, what kind of regulatory challenges that does, does that throw up? And what kind of regulatory roadmap do you believe India should prioritize, India deserves at this point in time to cater to the innovation that we're seeing happening, as well as ensure that the guardrails continue to remain in place? 
Yeah, I think excellent uh, thought because this is something that uh, we need to uh, you know, now consider. But let us start with what data is up in front of us. I think <clears throat> the regulators have navigated the last three years. I'm talking now on the financial sector side extremely well. You know, the COVID challenge, uh, the post-COVID handling of the economy, keeping interest rates low despite a lot of push to uh, hike interest rates, which has allowed the economy to come back at the speed that it has, and at the same time nurturing uh, technology and allowing it. And I would think that uh, the regulatory approach of a sandbox is clearly working, and uh, <clears throat> whichever regulator you look at today is working within a sandbox. And within that sandbox, if you look at the entire advent of fintechs <clears throat> and uh, what they have achieved, I think it's remarkable. Yeah. I have gone on record to say that um, what I see uh, the fintechs having built is extraordinary platforms. They're extraordinary platforms. But um, unfortunately, uh, their aspiration to uh, valuations could have put them on a wrong track. So I'm sure they will uh, correct themselves and uh, there will be a path for them. And I think at this point of time, they'll be carefully watched by the regulator. And the equation to me is very simple. If you do not make a profit, I can't see the regulator allowing you uh, greater degrees of freedom to do various things. So it is basically, uh, you know, you regulate yourself first. And uh, in that, I think the simple metric is you regulate yourself, govern yourself well, and make money, a reasonable profit. And then I think the regulator will be uh, open uh, to looking at uh, how uh, you could expand your sphere of uh, activity. So I think in another couple of years that will happen because these players are really important from what I would say triggering systemic change mm. because only by them having around, being around will incumbents uh, you know, be able to change because they would have had no option uh, but to change. So you've, they've been able to trigger systemic change. The question is, how quickly will the incumbents then adapt? Uh, and you feel confident of the adaptability or you feel less so? See, again, uh, the two metrics that I pointed out, the data consumption in five years, where it reached and at what cost. <clears throat> and uh, our country being the largest, uh, having the largest number of daily digital transactions, uh, clearly indicate that uh, you don't have too much time. If all that could be done in uh, less than five years, well, UPI adoption virtually less than three years, three, three and a half years. Uh, I would think that uh, that's about the time that you would have to change. Because so three to five year yeah, window is what you believe the banking is going sector to be, has? Uh, there is going to be a big rush of uh, you know, players doing uh, various things. Now, let's step back and let's look at what all has already been disrupted so that you know, I should not appear to be just you know, speaking my mind off, uh, looking at a few data points. Question, what has happened in the broking industry? You had incumbents embedded there for 15, 20 years. Virtually in the span of the first six months of the COVID era, they were knocked off. And uh, who were the winners? Basically straight through process processors. At virtually, I would think, met that uh, test. Uh, fit high care, free high care uh, test. And they actually provided the product free. They may have made money in other ways, through a DMAT account and so on. But they disrupted. Who could be the next disruptors? I think the AMCs are going to be the next disruptors. Now, then would be uh, uh, general insurers. Life insurance is a little tougher. And the banks and NBFCs are, uh, I think, uh, clearly in line of sight of anybody who can uh, you know, put into play technology in an appropriate manner. In the line of sight with a three to five year window, uh, uh, th those, are, those are cautionary comments uh, uh, coming in there from KV Kamath that I think industry does need to take note of. Speaking of disruption, Mr. Kamath, uh, you know, uh, at the listing of geofinancial services, you said that uh, it's going to provide growth momentum like never seen before. Lay out for us the vision that you, that you have. I know, I know you won't, you won't uh, uh, talk specifics, but lay out for us the vision that you have, sir. Uh, I think uh, anything that I say will be a forward look statement and I don't want to do that. And, uh, this five, is, uh, five years is too forward, is, sir. We're is, not asking you about the next for, quarter. Uh, this is for the CEO to talk about, uh, not for me. No, but, 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 what, but, should talk but about. What, what role and relevance do you believe an entity like this can play? No, I sketched a larger picture for uh, all uh, players as to what's the disruption like. And uh, I would think anybody entering the market today uh, will need to uh, wear that hat. And um, otherwise, uh, I think uh, success is going to be constrained. 
what keeps you going? To, you know, you're, you're still at it. Uh, uh, you continue to, to find new ways of staying relevant, of new ways of keeping yourself alive and learning, uh, you know, the, uh, and opening yourself up to the opportunities that the environment presents. What keeps you going, yeah, Mr. Keep, Kamath? Yeah, I'll tell you, simply put, uh, I keep uh, going because I learn. Very simply put, that is all. Uh, you know, Bricks Bank was a learning experience. A nap feed was a learning experience, and in this also is a learning experience. <laughs> so you don't stop learning, and you find purpose in learning. That's a simple uh, and true, uh, you know, something I've said from my heart. That's all that keeps me going. Otherwise, I would not have... Uh, actually, I said that uh, uh, I've had uh, three times in my career I've said I'm going to retire. First was in 95, uh, just before I got back to India. Uh, I had said, uh, you know, I went out to Asian Development Bank for a purpose, I am now actually putting in my papers and going back to India. Then uh, Mr. Vagul happened, he came and said, uh, late. so I came back. And my, my wife asked me, what do you want to do now? I said, I want to go and learn. I may go to college again, I was then 46 or so, and I want to learn. This is 95 or so. Then it happened again when I stepped down from my CSA and said, I want to learn. And some of my colleagues actually gifted me books. So uh, <laughs> those books remained largely unread because I went on to something else. So uh, it's this quest for learning, I think, uh, keeps me going. It's the unending quest for learning. What is the, the biggest lesson that you've learned in the last few years? Or, or the, the biggest sort of takeaway, the biggest realization for you yeah, in the last biggest, few years? Biggest, uh, again, we are not factoring this in. That is uh, the way uh, the youth of, uh, at least in our country, I don't necessarily track abroad, are uh, driving directional change in their aspirations. Uh, all you have to do is, sometimes uh, what I do is, before going to sleep, 10-15 minutes, I look at what are the blogs or vlogs on YouTube that are trending. This could be a 20-year-old kid who suddenly you find has got 22 million subscribers. He had less than a lakh subscribers uh, just, uh, uh, just, just uh, two years or three years back. You've got daily views of 7 and 8 million. Now you then try to see what is driving these guys. Uh, what is then uh, driving aspiration of others? What are the comments that come in? And it's a huge learning as to the sort of uh, aspirational drive that is there in maybe the 10, 15,000 comments this chap gets on a daily basis. I think uh, makes your day in the sense that things are happening. The youth is driving uh, forward. And uh, indeed, he is earning very well. I salute, uh, and I salute every such person who is doing something interesting where people are finding that uh, this is inspirational and are trying to follow. I'm not talking of other uh, things. Other things, of course, are there which educate you. But these are the sort of things, the youth, the way they are transforming is what is uh, useful. And today, again, for a fintech, I'll say this. If you are, uh, you know, what I would call um, uh, initial um, uh, focus group, you know, we used to call it focus group, is not uh, between the age of 15 and 18, you're not going to succeed. So if you've got a product, try it out with a 15 to 18-year cohort and, uh, of course, pay them for, uh, you know, their uh, advice. And then you see what will happen. Go to a school, run a session there, and uh, you will get more inputs than all your uh, senior team put together, middle-level middle team and junior team put together. So is KV Kamath going to start a vlog anytime no, no, soon? No, no. no? I, I, I'm content watching vlogs. <laughs> okay, content watching vlogs. Yeah. I'm going to take one or two questions here from the audience. Uh, uh, if, yes, sir. Go, go ahead. We will get the microphone across to you. If you can just stand up, he'll, he'll find it easier to be able to place you. Good evening, sir. My name is Sakar Yadav. I'm the founder of myitreturn.com. Uh, it's a tax filing website. We have also won the Atmanirbhar Award. Uh, my customers feel ki hum fit hai. we are fit for getting into the fintech space. Whether we can do it free or not, I think we will learn. My question is more basic. Is the debt to GDP ratio today, where do you see it going in the next five years? And what are the two or three things that India or anybody should be doing to see it reaching there, uh, uh, reaching wherever you feel it should be there? Yeah, I think uh, very good question. But on your first, uh, you know, what you introduced, uh, saying that uh, the customer, the customer will have to pay, a reasonable thing. Now, you look at a scenario, this is true for everybody, where can you bring your operational cost to near zero? You know, I think uh, if you do straight through, you'll come to near zero. Can you bring your risk, it is credit losses, to near zero? Again, using technology, all these techniques. Yes. Then what happens? You are providing the, a product to your customer, in this case, financial product, at a cost significantly cheaper than what it is today. 
because the margin would increase. And that margin can be you know, basically shared between the customer and yourself. So by doing this, you are not. So what you are leveraging is the open source out there. So uh, I celebrate uh, somebody like you. And I think somebody like you is going to be an important part of the wealth management product. So imagine a wealth management product where the, the wealth management provider says, I will facilitate even your filing. Every single thing that is a data point today can be pulled from various plugs. Finally, it goes to your plug and is filed straight through. Is anybody doing it today? Not to my knowledge. So I think things can be done dramatically. Now, the second question was uh, more, uh, I think, down to earth. What, what about the debt to GDP ratio? So the way I look at it is uh, if you look at other countries, uh, developing countries in particular, it is not that the debt to GDP ratio is significantly uh, different. Uh, it is packaged differently. So you take China, for example. You said we used to believe that there was no government borrowing at all. Yes, there is no budgetary borrowing. And the borrowing is not also through the budget of the provincial government. So where is it being borrowed? The provincial government has got an SPV or a company. That company is borrowing. Who is funding it? The banking system is funding it. What happens when it doesn't pay after three years? It gets rolled over. How many times it is rolled over? I have seen it rolled over three times at least. And then an ARC is created. Mm. And of course, it was originally an ARC. 2000 used to be called ARC. But the last round in 27, 18, 19, they called it AMC. Mm. So an AMC is created. And the cycle goes on. So now instead of three-year rollover, the AMC issues long-term paper. Mm. And the same bank subscribe, old debt is cleaned up and you go on. So I think debt to GDP, there are very, very many ways to handle this. But what is uh, you know, I think not negotiable is you have to grow. This whole engine will come to a halt uh, with even not overloaded debt to GDP, but even reasonable debt to GDP if you don't grow. So if you grow at 8 to 9 percent, your ability to service debt uh, is of a different order as compared to what uh, would happen if you were to grow at 3 percent. And at 3 percent, even if your debt to, debt to GDP issue looked good, you may not be able to service it. So, uh, yes, it is a challenge, but uh, the, number, the growth numbers we are thinking of, I think we will uh, be able to manage it. You know, so I just want to like, get in a question here on China since you brought that up as an example specifically. And I think many at this point in time believe that we are underestimating the slowdown in China and underestimating the scale of the problem in China. And this perhaps could be one of the biggest global risks and global threats that we will have to deal with because a slowing China uh, may not necessarily be the best as far as global growth is concerned. You know, I, I wanted to get your perspective on how you look at China today. Yeah, I think uh, numbers are not very clear. Uh, general uh, anecdotal evidence is it is uh, slowing down. To what extent, we don't know, because the rating agencies are not lowering growth estimates, so we really don't know. I would look at the good coming out, uh, for us in particular, we'll talk about the globe in yeah. a moment. For us, the good coming out is if uh, there is a slowdown in China, commodity prices should immediately uh, you know, be... Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, comfortable, and uh, we, we would have it uh, right. As far as our country is concerned, we have the absorption capacity today. So we can absorb what we produce. So we can continue to produce for the home market and grow at a much lower uh, price point than we otherwise would have done in a hot global market as it is. So I'm not uh, too much worried about ourselves. The equation that we have to, mention, uh, uh, we have to keep in mind is the interest rate equation, mm. because to me, all the good of the last few years could be upset if uh, we allow uh, inf interest rates to again uh, go up. And of course, we'll have to figure uh, appropriate measures to uh, combat inflation. Hmm. But how concerned are you about that? Both that inflation that we're seeing may not necessarily be transient, it's probably going to be longer, yeah. uh, higher for longer, yeah, but as well as the rate trajectory, the expectation yeah. was that we will start to see it ease, it may not. Yeah, I think uh, I will look at the way I look at interest rates. This is. You know, I have a lot of times said that I am not an economist, so you will uh, With pardon, that caveat pardon, my, <laughs> pardon my ignorance. But let me honestly, I am saying honestly, I think uh, economic theory that was written in the last century is clearly outdated. That to me is very visible. And the West is, a, West is ready to junk it. So did they respond in time to uh, the sort of inflation that they had? No. They were lagging away, and Europe in particular. Yes. So uh, they are learning to live with a new uh, paradigm as it were. I think in our case, I'm not for a moment saying that uh, we forget uh, inflation and uh, do what we want on the interest rates. No. I think we need to calibrate. So, for example, now, if you have a problem with the price of certain vegetables mm. or uh, fruit or whatever, 
Uh, will an interest rate increase uh, you know, correct the situation? You need to have deep analysis on this, not desk chair analysis. And after that, somebody could say for A, B, C reasons, the interest rate has to go up. And when it goes up, this, this, this happens. I have not seen anybody put this out. But there could be other areas. Is the property market heating up? Mm. And what is the way I can control it? Yes, then you need a directed uh, uh, approach to settle the property market. Interest rate could be one of the tools. But are there other tools? So again, as I said, not being an economist, uh, I have not delved too, too deep into this. But I'm sure people uh, will now start looking at this issue deeper because they have understood uh, uh, you know, that living with the low interest rate has brought us tremendous rewards. Now for bankers, I'll put this across. Uh, China experience is interesting also on the fact that typical lending for corporate or retail purposes was around 5%. Mm -hmm. And our lending, let us say, is 10%. So now, in our case, at 10% uh, lending, uh, we can figure out in how many years will your NPA double? Around seven years, 7.2 years? Your, if an asset becomes an NPA, it will double. Mm. At 5% five, five how many years will it take? Almost 15 years. So between 15-15 it's 15, 15 years, you'll get two economic cycles, which will again bring the boat up. Mm. So we have not factored this in into the whole equation, that we once an asset becomes an NPA, within the next cycle, we cannot correct it. Because a whole lot of processes. Yeah. And the interest rate is just cutting into the banks. Uh, so I think there is a lot of merit in looking at uh, you know, how this is managed. And uh, is somewhere uh, some new economic theory being written? And, and then, perhaps uh, more targeted then, no, intervention then than is a... Is it worth, worth uh, us looking at it? No, I'm not saying we should look at it. Something worth considering. I'm going to take the last question here. We're completely out of time. There was somebody... Uh, yes, ma'am, go ahead. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, my question is like based on the discussion you had where you told that to reach out to the age group especially between 15 to 18 for advice. So something struck me like I, I just thought imagine that in that age gap of 15 to 18. So uh, what advice you will be giving uh, for the fintech transformation? Yeah, very, very simple. You know, I meant it as uh, you know, one part of it but I will give you specifically something on that front. Basically, let us say you are developing a new uh, app or a website. Website is passe now. It will be an app. <laughs> if there's a new website being, uh, a new app being developed, who are the right people to give you feedback on that? Mm. Uh, not somebody like me. Uh, uh, <laughs> not who, somebody who is in the 60s. Not somebody in the 50s. Not in the 40s. Not even 30s. Mm -hmm. It is that young cohort uh, which can probably say what is it they want. Yeah. Because that's what's going to write. And not the, all the content, but the way the the look, feel, and the comfort mm -hmm. with the website, uh, the app, these are the people who will uh, give you the most uh, valuable advice. Then you can evaluate whether I want to so entire mm -hmm. set of advice or bit of advice they have given or only part of it. But that Thank is you. where you look for. So, I, so, I would look. so chase the early adopters is the message there from KV Kaman. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for the, the long-term India bull. Uh, and of course, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Kamath, for joining us here this evening on a historic moment as we saw the Vikram lander land on the surface of the moon, India creating history. Uh, and thank you so much for being here and sharing that moment with us. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause. Thank you, Shireen. Thank you, Mr. Kamath, for that engaging and informative discussion. All right, the stage is getting set for another panel discussion. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving to our next discussion, which is titled FinTech and Banking collaboration and lending for the new economy. FinTech ecosystem is rapidly growing, altering the role of banks with advancement of technology. FinTechs are leveraging technology to have lower costs, better product suite, agile operating model, whereas banks have the benefit of scale. It is imperative that collaboration between the two should accelerate so that they can benefit from each other's strengths to provide better and more customized 
service at the most optimal cost. And to discuss more on the collaboration between banks and fintechs, may I please invite Ritu Singh, Associate Editor, CNBC TV 18, to moderate this session. Ritu, may I also invite the panelists for this discussion. Put your hands together for Chetna Sinha, Founder Chairperson, Mandeshi Bank. Sucharita Mukherjee, Co-Founder and CEO, Kaleidafin. Shinjini Kumar, Founder and CEO, Soltap. And N.N. Srinivasu, Co-Founder, Bildesk. Along with Rishi Gupta, MD and CEO of Fino Payments Bank. Over to you, Rishi. Thank you. Thank you and uh, thank you.